Our next speaker knows that I hold the utmost respect for him as one of the great men that gave us the moon. One of the men that were brave enough to dare to go where no one had gone before, to show us that we humans can be more than just earth dwellers. Since then, he has been a staunch proponent of getting humans to Mars. Buzz, as of course I'm speaking of no other than Buzz Aldrin, Buzz is one of the few people on Earth that can literally say, the moon, been there, done that. I am happy to announce that your talk today centers on human missions to the next destination, Mars. What more do I need to say? As you, Buzz, have said it so eloquently for so many years already, perhaps I best leave it to the words of a famous man. Get your ass to Mars. I give you all Buzz Aldrin. Thank you. Thank you. I think there are a lot of people out there, but I can't see too many. Well, I have some last minute jottings and uh, things may run over a little bit unless I talk fast. Humans to Mars is our dream. And thank you for inviting me here. It has been the ultimate dream for many, many presidents, even JFK. A week before his speech before Congress, he went to NASA and said, I think we should go to Mars. Now, they had a very busy weekend studying. They then go and tell him that maybe we could get to the moon in 15 years. Now, it's been my dream, really, since 1985, because up to that point, I was interested in Earth, Mar Moon, cycling orbits for tourists, where they might win a lottery in the Share Space Foundation. But NASA was not impressed. I was disappointed. The administrator, when we went to the moon, Tom Paine, had offices in Santa Monica. He said, Buzz, don't get depressed. You know, use your gravity assist and see if you can make that work between Earth and Mars. It's not that difficult, really, as long as you do it with the seat of your pants. But he was always an advocate for Mars. And so he suggested that I do this in the first Earth-Mars uh, cycler was born. And it was discovered that there is only one during a synodic period. There you come back and repeat everything in 26 months. Since then, Purdue, former JPL, with graduate students, have come up with two cyclers alternating, and they do an Earth, a year and a half later, Earth, Mars. The second one does an Earth, Earth, Mars. Now, I still have hopes that we can get the ideal Earth, Earth, Mars, Mars, Earth, Earth, Mars, Mars. That would really be great, and, and we'll keep working on it. But in the meantime, we're working on the S1, L1 trajectories of uh, Purdue in uh, my cycling pathways to Mars. Now, I've been a witness to many things in the past since I uh, left NASA. Uh, there was a two-stage, fully reusable, wings and wheels on the booster, a crew of two in the booster. Never, well, it was canceled eventually. I should have objected, uh, but I uh, let that one go by, and we lost time and money. Then we're a little late, coming on with the shuttle, crew and cargo together. 
big cargo bay. Not so great. Wasn't too enthused with solid rockets either. We lost a couple of crews. The accident board said, do not fly after 2010. Well, we flew it a couple more times. Then we came up with a constellation program. And frankly, I wasn't particularly in favor of the crew on a solid rocket. Uh, the four segment solid was going to win that contract hands down. The Orion weight was growing more and more take fuel out of Orion, put it in the lander, still didn't quite work. Ah, ATK had a five-segment solid in the back room. Here we come. Uh, solid rockets burn from the inside. Don't want to go into that, but a four-segment solid probably vibrated a little bit, but people were saying there's shock waves on the outside. But the five-segment solid clearly vibrated so much that it would not be usable on with the crew, even with springs on it. But somehow, it's okay for an external tank with an oxygen tank on top of the cross beam and hydrogen. It's okay if it vibrates. We will see. Now, uh, I may say a few things off the record about here. I believe our space program in many ways is worse off than it was in April 1961, a month before President committed us to go to the moon. You can just kind of figure out what we have now and what we had then. We had an organization, we had a Mercury program, we had crew, and we had the public and the administration behind us. That's a heck of a lot better than we have right now. Now, we have three programs that sort of formed themselves out of some of the leftover things that uh, weren't quite working. We have an SLS, a government design taken from previous items put together. 1970s technology that went in the shuttle. A few corrections. It competes with the private sector. I thought most of us were in the process of learning that the government shouldn't do that. We were NACA before NASA became operation. Now we are advising because the private sector is coming along. I think maybe we should slowly revert back to the NACA advisory model. And perhaps a uh, NASA center that's competing with the private sector would do much better in the very exciting area of in-space propulsion and spacecraft, including how we get from one place to another, like Mars, landers, moon and Mars, refueling, so crucial. All the ISRU, the nuclear reactors that are needed for refueling, best place to refuel is not at the moon. That's good for SLS, but it's not the best place to refuel. Low Earth orbit. Stay there. Don't use Earth fuel to go way out there. So uh, we have uh, an ISS. We've talked the uh, Europeans and Japanese to extend that. But if we could put up a commercial station sooner, the public would like something to fly with crew in it before 2023, or did that come back down to 2021? We could gradually phase out into a commercial station at the Chinese inclination. 
a nice gesture, not the same orbit. Orion, I've found in my discussions, it's rather marginal for its use at Mars. We send landers there. And with the new program of refueling, we have commercial crew getting to the moon. We have landers getting to the moon. They get in one, they land, they refuel, they refuel again. I'm not sure I see where Orion fits in there either, except it would be a great crew return vehicle matched with the company's uh, space hab which it seems to uh, be very closely aligned. Uh, all this is off the record, so uh, no eggs, please. Uh, um, it's just how somebody needs to say some of these things and get them out in the open. Now, there are a few words that I have uh, given in the speech to, an all, to all the political candidates in CPAC in March of this year. And I'll give about half of it and then bore you with some slides and uh, then finish up. <clears throat> Americans are historic explorers and the world leaders in human exploration. Mars is America's next destination. If we do not lead there, others will. Americans have a very unique opportunity through the application of cycling pathways to getting to Mars first and staying there. First in science and exploration require a special kind of leadership, the sort that is defined by courage. Our nation needs to find that courage again, needs to start breaking the code again on human space exploration. Like all big undertakings, journeys and campaigns, the act of reaching a faraway destination, building national enthusiasm, and completing the mission begins with the first step. I know about those. My friend Neil Armstrong and I took a few of those 47 years ago. It's time for America to start doing that again. That is the heart of my challenge to all of you today. In this room, today, most of you will outlive me but America's leadership legacy in space, crystallized in our next steps on the surface of Mars, will outlive us all. It is now on our watch. In this moment, at this exact time, we must prove ourselves equal to this challenge and get this courageous, exploring space-faring nation back on track and out to the surface of Mars to continue mankind's unending legacy of exploration. It will take you, this is presidents now, that leading the American people to say yes to the mission and yes to a system I call cycling pathways to Mars. Cycling pathways is an engineering approach, technically sound, ready to be put into practice. It's not a detailed analysis. The physics is all there. Moreover, continuing refinements at Purdue and MIT, Florida Tech, with the Buzz Aldrin Space Institute, will confirm if we start now that successful human landings for continuous occupancy can reach Mars by 
2040. So now let's pause for a little bit and have some confusing charts. Now, okay. Uh, okay, we notice that this is the Earth and the clock does not go clockwise. Everything in orbit goes counterclockwise. So this is sort of 2020, 20, 25, 2030, 20, 20, 20, And so we're going to start out here with a uh, XM, no, EM1. We're going to send an unmanned uh, Orion uh, around the moon. Well, I think also in that year, 2018, we could put a Bigelow 330 in low Earth orbit. My bet would be 42 degrees where the Chinese space station will be. Not the same plane, but the same inclination. Then we'll follow that by putting a Cygnus ab here in lunar polar orbit. I'll explain that in a minute. Second Bigelow and a second one of these, then a space hab that are being competed now by the four companies. Obviously, two primes, Boeing and Lockheed, would be partnered with Bigelow and with Cygnus to be able to, for them to be a part of this because these are going to be joined together with the hab in between and a very large solar array pointing at the sun. Why do we do that? We do that because we, th these are evolutionary of an Earth-Mars cycler too. They will have to la last 20, 30, 40 years. We don't want a lot of moving parts. We want things once deployed to be fixed. The solar arrays and the uh, radiators and everything else possible. Here's an example of the low Earth orbit. Now, I have a new definition for you. A cycler is a spacecraft in a permanent orbit around one or more gravitational fields. You know, when we do something around the Earth, we got to consider the sun and, uh, and the moon as perturbations. So now, this is a uh, Leo cycler. Why? Well, it looks like a cycler. It looks like the first evolution. And we're going to replace these with uh, Cygnus spacecraft. These are partners. No, not quite yet. These are partners now, the same circular array, and the radiators come down from these boxes that are up like this for launch. They fold down, and the solar arrays deploy in quadrants, and the radiators deploy downward. And this is a structure that uh, holds up these points, and it, in a quite revised, it uh, goes into the HAB module here. And we'll have a lot of, uh, maybe a port here and some sensors here, and maybe there is a port on the top, and some of the sensors that are used because the lunar uh, cycler in lunar polar orbit. Why? Well, you see in the, in the next slide. Okay, here is the Mars cycler coming by, and uh, we aero capture the landers here, and uh, they go out into a high ellipse, and they come back to either uh, enter Phobos orbit or to land. If they're in Phobos orbit, we end up with uh, one at Phobos 
and two relay stations, so there is always at least one in contact with the base that we are building, putting together. Now from Earth, we put these things there. Whatever the distance apart, they go to an assembly uh, line. You can't quite see it, but uh, if this is the base, and it's not gonna be that big relative to the moon, it's gonna be down here. But you see these are lined up, and these are lined up, and so are these. Uh, so there is an approach direction that can be intercepted from the ground and then terminal guidance. Probably a tall tower in the center uh, provides the terminal guidance for the assembly of these. Uh, now we have the lunar cycler pointing at the sun and its sensors uh, and the relay stations here. This is just an extra. Uh, we didn't get to erase that one. This was all done pretty. Now we got commercial crew going up to these cyclers and coming back. Commercial crew. Cheaper than Orion and SLS. Commercial crew extended from the LEO cycler. From the ISS to the LEO cycler to these. Now, we could go from this orbit down to this ferry orbit, and they could be in the same plane, but they don't have to be. These are options. Let's just say we choose a 100 nautical mile orbit that goes over where we want to land. Oh, we send a commercial crew. The lander uh, gets there. It's been refueled in low Earth orbit because SLS now is a fuel delivery system to low Earth orbit uh, until it's determined to be uh, much more expensive than other fuel deliveries. So now we've got a crew and a lander, and we land, and we land where we can refuel, but we leave the Earth return vehicle that the crew arrived in, so they refuel the lander, launch up again into this orbit, pick up the return capsule, go back to the Earth, but the lander's up here, refueled, and another crew comes in, we have a reusable lander. Much, much better than Apollo. No big Saturn Vs are needed. The refueling depots in the past have always been out in space. L1, L2, halo orbits, they belong on the surface right where the ice is, we get the water, we electrolyze, get the gaseous, hydrogen, oxygen, and we cool it off where the uh, real cold temperatures are. And we use a nuclear reactor. All of these things are planned for Mars. We're gonna need them really at the moon. This being so much better than Europe, Japan, Russia, China, coming up with their own big rockets and command and service module and all these. We work together and we have a much superior program. So you can see that the emphasis on the US is gonna be on the modules that are here uh, that are dealing with the uh, ISRU, the ICE, and getting the ice melted, it's very cold, minus 250 degrees centigrade. You can use uh, the heat from the reactor to melt that. Then you use the current, oxygen, hydrogen, gas. But you want it liquid. Well, you got a real cold spot over here. Pipe it down there very carefully so you don't have any 
humidity in those pipes. Otherwise, you'll get ice in the pipes and it'll clog it all up. So nothing works perfectly, but you've got to be very careful about what you do. I, my expertise is not thermodynamics. I know a little bit about it, uh, but we need to get these people around to use the things that are there and stop having fuel depots out in space somewhere. Refuel things at low Earth orbit. So that's where they depart from when the velocity is high. If you look very carefully at the NASA plans, everything is sent out to the moon with Earth fuel. It gets out there, they assemble it, send the crew out there. It goes to a depot in a space where you had to get the water there. Uh, so now you refuel it. What do you do next? If you read in fine print, you leave the moon and you come swing by the Earth, and that's where you put in the final delta V to go to Mars. Doesn't make sense. Stay in low Earth all the time. Now, uh, Uh, we're going to go to a circular chart. Uh, no. Okay, we're, we're going to go, why did we pick these orbits around the moon? Let's go to the, uh, the Global Lunar Coalition chart. No? I'm having trouble. We got in trouble. trouble. You're having trouble. I'm having trouble. All right, Phobos goes around Mars at 2.76 Mars radius, or 1.76 above the surface, and with relay stations. So at Mars, from Phobos and relay, we can assemble things on the surface. Okay, why go to L1? Why go to L2? That's a long ways away. Polar orbit around the moon, 2.76. No, that's not it. the other one. Okay, we're not going to get the other one. 2.76. So now we have a polar orbit, and we can assemble things there just the way we will at Mars. The base will look the same. We'll make improvements. In, in the base, we'll design it, we'll supervise the building by other partners, they will land it, it's landed, we'll bring them together and make the connections. Making the connections at Mars from Earth is too delicate. We need the people at Phobos to do that. From Earth, we need lots of time to bring these together. Now, let's see where we are. We've got uh, ice, we've got water, and we've got fuel. So around here, once we get these uh, lunar cycler here in this uh, orbit that's much closer to the moon than L1, L2, or heaven forbid, DRO, now, this is a low Earth orbit, fully capable of taking over the commercial aspects of a space station, unloading the ISS. The Europeans would much prefer putting their money into lunar activities than continuing to pay the prices to operate the ISS. So would JAXA. So would the United States. They're operators of the station. They can operate for Russia, or they can begin to transfer their operations to this uh, building, lunar cycler in low Earth orbit. OK, now we can begin to land some of the modules here and we can be putting them together slowly. We've got the fuel here. We start fueling 
crew, commercial crew from different nations. Where do the landers come from? Well, we can take a Mars lander and there's certain aspects of it that make a very good lunar lander. <clears throat> we can build those, lease those to the other countries. We, the U.S., is not going to be making very many lunar landers. Got to save our resources. We've cut down on the payments to ISS. Uh, SLS, big reduce payment. All right, so now the lunar base begins to look like this. You can see the lines of approach. Starts out with three uh, modules right in the center, and at, re at each apex, you put two more and make another triangle. So instead of three directions, you now have six directions for six nations to grow outward. And we have places for rovers to come in, power, water, and food. Now we start landing some of these modules on Mars. Uh, right here, when we uh, assembled the LEO station, we can now send either a Bigelow or Orion to an asteroid. Now, the robot gets there an hour and a half earlier, and uh, then the crew gets there for 60 days. <clears throat> uh, the Buzz Aldrin Space Institute is at Florida Institute of Technology. We start, we, we have a female visit of a flyby with Orion and a HAB in about 2030. We're landing objects at Mars. We're beginning to put them together from the Earth, then from Phobos. If we're real shrewd about what we're doing, we can have one crew at Phobos goes up there with two landers, two people in each. Four people and one lander are at Phobos, plus a few others that we put there on earlier missions. Those crew members finish the job. If they finish the job, they land from Phobos, just as another four or eight come in on the next cycler. The cycler can be intercepted by one lander and a propulsion system. That's no redundancy. We can have two or three. Design reference missions number five out of NASA has zero redundancy. Boeing and Lockheed, redundancy for the trans-Mars injection burn. I don't care if you got a launch window, you got an ignition time, you got a trajectory and a delta V. You better get that delta V. You're not going to get to Mars. You're not coming back to Earth, down to 80% of what you're looking for. You're in solar orbit with no rescue. Those are the missions that NASA has been putting forth as design reference mission. We can do better. Uh, and I can finish up quickly with this. Uh, by saying that uh, technical papers now confirm that my present cycler architecture emphasizes reusability with resupply for low cost transfer of crews. This really can be unique and efficient. The earthbound equivalent would be the economies of ferry boats taking people over and then they, as it swings by, they jump off and other people get on board and come back. Continuous cycling space craft with two or Mars, more Mars landers with redundant propulsion will intercept the cycler as it swings by for a six month transfer uh, to the moon or the Mars Phobos. Phobos will duplicate the telerobotic assembly of the 
global lunar complex from a U.S. spacecraft close by in lunar polar orbits. These expanded maneuvers at the moon are much, much better, easier than Apollo. It will make it much cheaper for the other nations to become a part of the global lunar consortia. Choosing to lead with various cycler systems not only puts America back to the forefront of human space exploration, but offers a significant way to bring together all other spacefaring nations, especially China. Together, we can bring forward a worldwide sharing for the greatest human endeavor in history. Presidential leadership in this initiative would improve, extend, and celebrate American exceptionalism in a way that no other policy or program could. Cycling pathways to visit, occupy, and inhabit Mars must be organized progressively with a decision made to go throttle up now. As Neil and I said, standing as proud Americans from our exceptional nation with the whole world behind us, we came in peace for all mankind. We Americans do these things, think big, act on our dreams, and then look back and bring the world along with us. So to this room full of leaders, presidential candidates, let me say this is the time to venture outward again, much further in space, bringing humanity out to Mars, making history there as we Americans have here. Listen closely to my challenge. The president who appeals to our higher angels and takes us closer to the heavenly body we call Mars will not only make history, he or she will be long remembered as a pioneer for mankind to reach, to comprehend, and to settle Mars. And if not now, when? And if not us, who? I appeal you to take up the challenge, president, candidates, and bring us all along from the wild blue yonder with giant leaps to this waiting island in the blackness of space. This is the time. This is our time. This is your time. It's an honor to be here with you, and I salute those who have the courage to lead this great nation forward taking the next advances, which are, are, are our destiny. As Ronald Reagan said, we Americans have a rendezvous with destiny. Your supporter and dedicated warrior for peace, Moon, Mars, Guy, Buzz, let's go for it. Questions will be taken to buzzoldren.com <laughs> or Twitter 
at the real buzz.